Welcome to the CEC Report. It's the 12th of May. I'm Robert Barwick and I'm joined today by CEC Leader Craig Isherwood. Welcome Craig. Yeah, thanks Robbie. In this week's CEC Report, an effective banking inquiry would lead to one conclusion, Glass-Steagall. And new US foreign policy taking shape, but Australia is stuck in the old order. Um, Craig, before we begin, just to remind the viewers, what we cover in the CEC report every week is reported in detail in the CEC's weekly magazine, the Australian Alert Service. So if you're really interested in what we've talked about, you can call in on a toll-free number and get a copy of that. We really urge you to do that because um, the devil's in the detail, right? We can only do justice to a certain amount of these topics, but it's important to, the world is changing very fast and it's important to keep up with it especially because we're actually winning the, the, the main fights that we're waging, um, and we have waged for a long time, Craig, yep. and as this first subject will um, uh, demonstrate. So first, an effective banking inquiry would lead to one conclusion, Glass-Steagall. So suddenly, in Australia, we are seeing dramatic moves towards a Glass-Steagall breakup of the big banks, right? And so just... For the first time viewers, explain yeah, Glass-Steagall. Yeah. I was going to say, Rob, because we talk about this a lot in the CEC, and this is policy of Glass-Steagall. This is the policy that was introduced by Roosevelt in 1933, which effectively dealt with the global financial crisis back then that, that saw tens of thousands of banks shut down in the US. It's where Roosevelt said that commercial banks, the ordinary boring banking side of They're things... They're also known as retail banks. Retail banks could not be associated with the more speculative merchant and trading banks. They had to be split apart and broken up. And that meant that you know the, the deposits could be insured of depositors and so forth. Now what we're doing today is calling for the same policy. Break up the big banks, break up the big four so you have a retail arm, a commercial banking sector, and then all the other speculative stuff with investment banking, stockbroking houses, yep. insurance companies uh, and so forth are completely separated out. There's, they're different entities. So that's what Glass-Steagall is about. And Robbie, the important thing for Australian banks, the big four, is mm. people say, well, what's this got to do with Australian banks? Only are banks secure? No, they're not. They are highly exposed through their borrowings and so forth to two things. One, the Australian property bubble, which is in the process of blowing out. Yep. And secondly, the overseas borrowing from other institutions overseas. So if our banking system right, particularly the commercial banking system is not, in a sense, quarantined and protected mm. from all the other speculative stuff, we will go down the tube when this new uh, global financial crisis yep. blows out. And that's right. So it's, it's, a, it's the ultimate protection measure. And Craig, I refer to it as the most successful financial regulation in history because when it was in place in America for 66 years, there were no banking crises that threatened the whole world economy. And since then, of course, we've been mired in an ongoing one, frankly. Yeah, that was from when Roosevelt first brought it in, Robbie, at 66 years, right up until, unfortunately, President Clinton in 1999 repealed it. Yeah. So the latest development in Australia is this week, Scott Morrison, the day before the budget, um, which was a bank-bashing budget too, which is good. Good on you, Scott. <laughs> he told the Financial Review that he plans to establish a productivity commission inquiry into separating retail banks from financial advice businesses. You know, he's only, he's, so it's only a partial separation. He's talking about one sector. That sector though, Craig, has been very, very bad, right? Mm. Retail banks have used their retail customers and, and, and they've lured them into investments and things like Timbercorp, Great Southern, Storm Financial, this type of stuff, and lots more. All the banks have been involved in this. There's been scandal after scandal in the last decade, and it's ruined ten, tens of thousands of people around Australia. So he's talking about that kind of breakup. Now, when we heard this, one thing was very obvious. Um, the, the fruits of our labour are, are becoming evident, right? We have been pushing this really hard for a long time, as regular viewers would know. So this is the result of our work. That's not just it, though. Much more importantly, we can tell that our government is looking at the developments in the United States, right? Because suddenly Glass-Steagall is the big issue in the United States. It's dominating everywhere. As you and Elisa discussed last week, Donald Trump gave an interview to Bloomberg um, and he, for the first time he personally reiterated he's looking at breaking up the big banks. He pledged it in the campaign. His White House... Chief um, Spokesman Sean Spicer has reiterated it twice on his behalf, but this is the first time Trump personally said it. 
And what happens in the American system, when, a, when the president gets behind legislation, right, that legislation gets prioritised. And this is potentially what can happen here. Certainly, the banks think so. There was a funny story that came out of the media um, because uh, a guy who's anti glass Eagle wrote in the New York Times and he relayed this anecdote that while Trump was giving this interview in Bloom to Bloomberg, his Treasury Secretary was giving a speech on the West Coast. That speech did not mention breaking up the banks at all. However, all the audience were suddenly getting messages on their phones that Donald Trump had just said he's going to look at breaking up the big banks. And why were they getting those messages on their phones? Because they're on edge about this, right? They know this is a real live possibility. Um, now, there's, a, there's a, a conspiracy theory, though, that's built up, Craig. And I'm, I want to play a quick video just to put it to bed. The theory is that um, because Trump's chief economic advisor, Gary Cohn, is the former president of Goldman Sachs, one of the most notorious banks in the world, and Gary Cohn came out himself and said he supports Glass-Steagall, that it's getting around, oh, this, is, this really is a, is a Goldman Sachs conspiracy. They want Glass-Steagall because what's in it for them. So the boss of, of Goldman Sachs, Lloyd Blankfein, gave an interview to CNBC this week. And he said, yes, Glass-Steagall, we could, we could adjust to it, but we don't want it. Just listen to it in his own words. In terms of uh, the possibility of uh, ring fencing coming back, do, do you think investment banks and commercial banks should be separated? You know, I think that, that, that um, the eggs are out of the shell and an omelet's been made. We are probably, and this has been pointed out, we are probably the large bank that's best positioned for a return to Glass-Steagall because we're not a universal bank. We have, we have some mm -hmm. of those functions, but very minor in relation to our investment banking activities. And so our adaptation to that would be relatively easy. That said, with that kind of uh, remoteness and that kind of perspective, I could say in 2017, it's really hard to differentiate functionality such that one institution could lend money and complete a loan mm -hmm. and another institution can underwrite a bond for the company, which may be the economic equivalent, but that's a security. Right. And so I think those issues have, I think the world has moved on. And by the way, all financial institutions around the world have dropped that dichotomy. Mm -hmm. So the U.S. would be a kind of island uh, in the world. And I don't think it makes as much sense now. But I could understand and I'm sympathetic to the idea that certain of the functionality related to securities create a different set of risks mm -hmm. than traditional lending. By the way, traditional lending is often the riskier activity. Mm -hmm. When you give money to your clients, as we do, yeah. you sit there and hope they pay you back. When you have a security on, the book, on your book and you get nervous about the credit underlying that security, you could sell that security in the market mm -hmm. and liquefy your position. So it's kind of ironic that, and in the crisis, it was the kind of bank-like activity, not the security activity right. that generated most of the losses. Yeah, so, so he's made it quite clear. Yes, Goldman Sachs is best positioned to adjust to Glass-Steagall. However, you know, the omelet's been made, etc. We can't put the toothpaste back in the tube, all that kind of stuff. But then look what he says at the end, because his whole spin on it was totally off. He's trying to make out that normal banking is risky. What they do is not risky. But only, it's only not risky because he admits to the kind of fraud in what they do. He said, if we have a product here, a security we don't like, we can just on-sell it. And that's what Goldman Sachs did, Craig, in the global financial crisis, knew they were selling dog turds, mm -hmm. and they packaged them up at AAA, and they on-sold them, and no one went to jail for that. And that that's guy right. was in charge of Goldman Sachs when it happened. So anyway, this is not a Goldman Sachs plot. They don't want it. They could, they'd have to adjust to it, but they don't want it. Why do they want it? Well, before we break, let me just ex briefly explain this. I'm going to just show a few graphs here to do this. Gla Here's why they don't want it. Glass-Steagall would cut the parasite off from the host. So to understand that, you've got to understand the derivatives bubble, which is hundreds of trillions of dollars. But derivatives went from being nothing. Over-the-counter mm. derivatives were nothing in about 86. By 1999, they were just shy of $100 trillion. Craig, in, in, in a little bit over a decade, they'd grown $100 trillion. And then Bill Clinton repealed Glass-Steagall. And the year after he repealed Glass-Steagall, they passed a law deregulating all derivatives. The combination of both was that 
with deregulated, totally deregulated derivatives and those banks being able to grab people's deposits to gamble with, with their derivatives, the rate of growth of derivatives went from um, $100 trillion in a bit over a decade to $100 trillion a year. And you can see that on the, the graphs we'll show on the screen. And they're, they're showing different aspects of it. Some uh, just interest rate derivatives, etc. But you can see the 1999-2000 uh, spot where it had certain growth up to that point and then the growth rate went through the charts. That's what the repeal of Glass-Steagall did. And if you cut those banks off from those deposits that they're exploiting, right, they don't have, the parasite doesn't have a host Insured anymore. Insured deposits, Robbie. Yes. That's the key here. That's right. Because right. this, you know, if the banks go under, then they know the government's going to bail them out. And this was done already in the first global financial crisis to the tune of $22 trillion. But see, Robbie, where does that money go? Well, that money gets lent to businesses. Those businesses then take that money, right, and then they actually use it to buy back their own shares, yep. right, or they go to issue their own bonds. And this has built up an enormous corporate bond debt bubble. Debt bubble. And that's the next bubble that's about to explode. Yep. All right, so let's take a break and we'll come back and continue this discussion. Welcome back to the CEC report. We were discussing an effective banking inquiry would lead to one conclusion, Glass-Steagall. So Craig, back to Australia. Not only is Scott Morrison now talking about a type of banking separation, so is Labor, mm -hmm. so are the Greens. Now, all their proposals though are predicated on some type of inquiry. Morrison wants a, a productivity commission inquiry. Labor wants a royal commission. The Greens want a parliamentary commission of inquiry. Now this week, the Australian Alert Service, and we put out a press release as well, but you can find it in this, in the, um, in this week's Australian Alert Service. We have an article, Greens Banking Inquiry Must Be a Pecora Commission. Because there's, a, there's inquiries and there's inquiries. And most Australians would understand when I say that most inquiries end up being some kind of a cover-up, right? And especially, forgive our cynicism, a Royal Commission, because with a Royal Commission, by, uh, by the choice of commissioner and by the terms of reference, you can really limit the scope of this and it just becomes a rubber stamp for, for government policy. A proper inquiry is like the Pecora Commission. The Pecora Commission was an inquiry that took place in America in 1933 that preceded Glass-Steagall. And until this gentleman, Ferdinand Pecora, held 10 days of hearings in the US Senate, all the banks were well respected. They hadn't been blamed for the, the, the Great Depression that was afflicting the country in the 1929 crash. They got off scot-free. And PCORA was the last in a series of legal counsels for this inquiry. And all the previous ones were financial experts, Craig. And they looked at um, the, the, all the evidence that came before them. And all these financial experts saw standard financial practices. Mm -hmm. PCORA was not that. PCORA was a last minute appointment he was actually a criminal prosecutor from New York. He looked, was not a financial expert. He looked at the evidence and he thought, that's not right. That's, that sounds crooked to me. And he dug into it and he showed it. And he held 10 days of hearings. He got the biggest bankers in America to front those hearings and he ripped their mask off in those hearings and he showed them to be the crooks they were. If you've heard the term banksters, mm -hmm. that's, that's a popular term. That came from this inquiry. All of a sudden, these, these hearings were televised. The American people heard what a bunch of crooks they were. JP Morgan had to admit on the stand that he was selling shares to US congressmen at heavily discounted prices just so he could have them in his, in his influence, right? He was effectively bribing them. Um, the most important part, let me just explain this quickly. The, the bank that got the exposed the most was called National City, which is now actually Citibank, right? We all know Citibank. Um, and what they were doing is they would uh, offering $1 bank accounts, which was sort of unheard of, that you could open a bank account with as little as $1, but they were sucking in a lot of retail customers to their retail division. Mm -hmm. But they also had an investment division. And they were using they were those, that database of retail customers as, the, custom, as the, um, the basis for their bond salesmen, who they trained to be very aggressive. They gave them their names and said, go sell them bonds. And the bonds they sold them were worthless garbage. Right, and they, what they were doing was making these poor people pay so the rich people could get out of their bad investments and stuff like this. And 
That man was heavily fined. He, he only narrowly avoided going to jail. A whole bunch of people went, went to jail. But it was this inquiry that exposed all that that led Franklin Roosevelt, when he got inaugurated three days after the inquiry ended, he said this immortal line, he, ins he inserted it into, into his speech actually, practices of the unscrupulous money changers stand indicted in the court of public opinion, rejected by the hearts and minds of men. And it set the agenda of his first 100 days and that it resulted in the Glass-Steagall Act because when they looked at the whole package, what the US Congress saw is the way to solve this is separate the two types of banking out. And there's boring banking that serves real people and everything else is predatory. Is predatory. You, instead of trying to police every part of it, set up a wall so that whatever they do, they'll cause their own losses and they can wear their own losses. And they don't have access to depositors funds. None yeah. whatsoever. People might, want, people might want to put their money in with those merchant investment bankings as has always been done in the past, but they know the risk. Yep. The high, there might be higher returns in that side of it, but they know the risk. They can risk losing their money. So when all these politicians in, in Australia, Craig, all want these inquiries, Fine, if they're going to be genuine, like a Pakura Commission, but shouldn't they also learn from history and realise you therefore don't need an inquiry when you see Australia's banks acting so similar to what National City did in the 1930s? You don't need an inquiry to realise we need Glass-Steagall. Well, that's what we say, Rob. We need a Pakura Commission. If we're going to have a commission at all, but look, it's as, as the, the Treasury this week in, illustrated by trying to tax the banks with this new levy, 6%, which was going to be raised, you know, a very small yep. amount of money, the banks are and screaming blue murder, right? Because he's actually challenging the power of the banks. Mm. And that's not being done for a long time. That's interesting. They're used to being untouchable. How far he, he will push this to create the political space to go with Glass-Steagall is an interesting thing. Yeah. So we've created this agenda, as you said before. We've been on this campaign for many, many years, you know, over 10 years, you know, in terms of being able to have a Glass-Steagall type uh, law put in place in this country. And this is starting to bear fruit in terms of all these different predicates. That We're, winning. Out. We're winning. So two things. Um, if you want to know more about the Bakura Commission, call in and get a copy of our Australian Alert Service. Also, go to our um, uh, change.org petition and sign it. Right. Every time you sign it, politicians get emails on that and that's an effective thing to do. Let's take a break and we'll conclude the CEC report after that. Welcome back to the CDC report. Finally, new US foreign policy taking shape, but Australia stuck in the old order. And Craig, there's been a lot of chaos in America and a lot of media hype and whatever, but out of that chaos, something interesting is emerging. And we're gonna play a video now by Rex Tillerson, Donald Trump's Secretary of State, where he, or just an excerpt from it, where what he's saying is the era of American interventionism is over. That's, that's an interpretation you could put on this. So just listen to Rex Tillerson. So let's talk first about my view of how you translate America first into our foreign policy. And I think I approach it really that it's America first for national security and economic prosperity. And that doesn't mean it comes at the expense of others. Our partnerships and our alliances are critical to our success in both of those areas. But as we have progressed over the last 20 years, and some of you could tie back to the post-Cold War era as the world has changed. Some of you can tie back to the evolution of China since the post-Nixon era and China's rise as an economic power and now as a, a growing military power. That as we participated in those changes, we were promoting relations, we were promoting economic activity, we were promoting trade with a lot of these emerging economies and we just kind of lost track of how we were doing and as a result things got a little bit out of balance and I think that's as you hear the president talk about it that's what he really speaks about is look things have gotten out of balance and these are really important relationships to us and they're really important alliances but we got to bring them back into balance so whether it's our asking of NATO members to really meet their obligations even though those were notional obligations we understand and an aspirational obligation we think it's important that those become concrete and when we deal with our trading partners that things have gotten a little out of bounds here they've gotten a little out of balance uh, we've got to bring that back into balance because it's not serving the interests of the american people well so it doesn't have to come at the expense of others 
but it does have to come at an engagement with others. And so as we're building our policies around those notions, that's what we want to support. But at the end of it, it is strengthening our national security and promoting economic prosperity for the American people. And we do that, again, with a lot of partners. Now, I think it's important to also remember that guiding all of our foreign policy actions are our fundamental values, our values around freedom, human dignity, the way people are treated. Those are our values. Those are not our policies. They're values. And the reason it's important, I think, to keep that well understood is policies can change. They do change. They should change. Policies change to adapt to the circumstances. Our values never change. They're constant throughout all of this. And so I think the real challenge many of us have as we think about constructing our policies and carrying out our policies is how do we represent our values? And in some circumstances, if you condition our national security efforts on someone adopting our values, we probably can't achieve our national security goals or our national security interest. If we condition too heavily that others must adopt this value that we've come to over a long history of our own, it really creates obstacles to our ability to advance our national security interest, our economic interest. It doesn't mean that we leave those values on the sidelines. It doesn't mean that we don't advocate for and aspire to freedom, human dignity, and the treatment of people the world over. We do. And we will always have that on our shoulder everywhere we go. But I think it is, I think it's really important that all of us understand the difference between policy and values. And in some circumstances, we should and do condition our policy engagements on people adopting certain actions as to how they treat people. They should. We should demand that. But that doesn't mean that's the case in every situation. And so we really have to understand in each country or each region of the world that we're dealing with, what are our national security interests? What are our economic prosperity interests? And then as we can advocate and advance our values, we should. But the policies can do this. The values never change. Now, Craig, that, that, that's a little bit subtle, but if you know foreign policy, it's actually dynamite, what he has mm. just said there. But it's not what you get through the major media, Robbie. Like, nothing's really changed. They're trying to maintain the status quo. But well, let me prove something's changed. John McCain, the man, the US senator who has been the biggest champion of all these regime change wars, justified as, oh, we've got to go in there and save those poor people. Look, they're suffering so badly under Saddam Hussein. Let's go and murder a million of them, destroy their whole lives, create ISIS and call it freedom, right? John McCain. So he said, his response to Rex Tillerson is, this is why we must support human rights, says John McCain in, on May 8th. In a recent address to State Department employees, Secretary of State Rex Tillerson said, conditioning our foreign policy too heavily on values creates obstacles to advance our national interests. With those words, Secretary Tillerson sent a message to oppress people everywhere, don't look to the United States for hope. Right, so he's screaming about it, but that's the opposite of what's true. John McCain and his cronies have destroyed the world not since 2000. Well, since 1999 when Tony Blair gave his speech that demanded we can intervene on countries for humanitarian reasons yeah. and they destroy the world. Yeah, well, people should follow the Australian Alert Service, but we have to say more about this. Yeah, so this is a huge shift and unfortunately Australia has to get on, well, Australia has to get on board with it. But we're out of time, that's what's unfortunate. So thanks for tuning in and tune in next week for more.